Good afternoon. Now you heard the New Yorker say you got to say good morning. The Minnesotan says you got to say good afternoon. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. We have a great session planned to wrap up our conference. You know, there's a reason why the economic and social struggles of all modern industrialized societies were born in the struggles of mine workers to unionize, whether it was in the United States or in South Africa or in the Andes in Peru or in Indonesia. There's something about the life of the people who go down into the earth to make their living that changes the role they have in society and gives them a sense of justice that I think is unlike the experience that almost anyone else has in modern society. So I'm very pleased that to start our session this afternoon, we're going to hear from Richard Trumka, the president of the nation's largest labor federation, the AFL-CIO, and former president of the United Mine Workers. My old union, the United Steelworkers, was another union that had a long history with the mining industry on two counts. First of all, it was from the generosity of the United Mine Workers that the United Steelworkers was formed. It was their money, the sweat and toil of their members, their union dues that paid to organize the steel industry in the United States and thus create the industrial labor movement that we have today. But the steel workers also were born from an organization called the Mine Mill and Smelter Workers Union, which organized among the hard rock miners of the western part of the United States and had their own uh, history of struggle in the 19th century that was so important to the formation of American democracy and a middle class. And those unions still, many of them operate today. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, there is a different life experience. When you go down into the Homestake Gold Mine in Leeds, South Dakota, 9,600 feet, almost two miles below the surface of the earth, a 10-minute elevator ride every morning going down, to work in a landscape in which the face of the rock is 130 degrees, can't put your hand on it, and have to blow air-conditioned air down just to work every day. So when I say that the struggles of the mine workers are at the forefront of what gives us social justice in industrialized democracy, I mean it because of the strength and the enduring quality of the life of the people that uh, lived in those industries uh, gave back to all of us. So it's a great privilege to me that Rich Trumka and the AFL-CIO have spoken at every one of the Good Jobs, Green Jobs conferences that we've held uh, since the very first one in 2008. Uh, the Hecla Mining Company had a slogan that said, out of the earth and into our lives, to sort of describe the character of what the mining industry brought to all of us. Uh, so as a great advocate for social justice, as a great advocate and architect of the clean economy that we're all fighting for, I'm so happy to be able to present to you Rich Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO. Rich. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Dave, I want to thank you for that overly kind introduction. But really more importantly, I want to thank you for your friendship and for your leadership. Uh, you've done a tremendous job, not only at the Blue Green Alliance, but for representing working people all your life. And for that, on behalf of all of us, that are living a little bit better because of your efforts, I want to say thanks. Please give them a round of applause. And uh, Dave, I want to tell you, I'm glad to be here with you today to talk about the importance of this alliance. You see, the twin crisis of global climate change and joblessness demands that we do some great things. Facing each alone uh, is a staggering task, but together, these challenges really offer us uh, a measure of hope. 
the climate situation can only be solved if we retool our world, our factories, our power plants, our homes, our offices, our rail lines and vehicles, locomotives and planes and schools and hospitals. And they must all be modernized right now, upgraded, renovated and replaced with something cleaner, more efficient, and less wasteful. See, we have to fix the leaks and the seeps in America's natural gas and oil pipelines. And we have to keep developing green technology and, quite frankly, so much more. That transformation can mean jobs. It means opportunities for economic growth. It means building a path uh, to a healthier world and a healthier world economy, one less dependent on volatile energy prices, one where more of us, more of us have the things that modern energy really makes possible. And that's how America can retake our position as the world leader in innovation, by stepping forward to meet the challenge. And to do it, quite frankly, we need a comprehensive energy and jobs strategy and bill that all of us, and I mean all of us, can get behind. Now, it can't be done piecemeal, and it has to be done big. On that point, allow me to commend uh, my friends, uh, Leo Girard, whose vision led to the founding of the Blue-Green Alliance, and President Billy Height of the United Association, uh, who in the last few months has seen the opportunity for the Blue-Green Alliance to stop dangerous greenhouse gas emissions and create good jobs by repairing and upgrading America's pipeline network. And I want to commend the Sierra Club for its role in founding uh, the Blue Green Alliance uh, with the steelworkers and Mike Bruin. And I don't know if Mike's here or not. I want to thank him for his continuing its steadfast commitment to supporting the workers' rights to organize. Now, we've not always seen eye to eye on how to address climate change. But what is important about the Blue-Green Alliance is the idea of the labor movement and the environmental movement working together to build on our common values and our common interests. See, at the heart of all of this is our shared belief that human beings and the planet that we share uh, with all creation must be treated as having a value and a dignity far beyond the profits that can be wrung out of both of them. Yet despite all the good work by everyone in this room, the only way that we can meet the enormous size of the challenges is with a, a comprehensive energy and jobs bill. Now a, a comprehensive energy and, and jobs bill needs to go to President Obama's desk, and it needs to get there this year. Now, now I'll be honest with you. I can just about hear the quote, unquote, political realist who point to the quagmire in Congress and think, comprehensive energy and jobs bill? Not a chance, right? Well, let me just say this, that uh, about last year at this time, not many of those political realists imagined that we would be as close as we are to comprehensive immigration reform. Although there's a lot more work to be done, we're real close despite what those political realists said last year. See, skepticism is healthy, but I'll tell you something. The naysayers are shortchanging the potential size and the power of a movement that combines environmentalists and labor and business. Now, I got to tell you, the reason why I love the mine workers that I came from, we were too dumb to know what we couldn't do. So we just go ahead and do it. 
But they would always tell us, you, you can't do that, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. we got to get past that. Because not only can we, we really must. We have to. For the good of everybody involved, for this planet, and for every human inhabitant on this planet. See, we've operated for a long time with incremental change. But I, I believe that together, it's possible for us to spark a, a sea change, something uh, to turn all those so-called conventional wisdom of believers and realists on their heads. But to make it happen, we've got to get our work in high gear. And let me say two things as directly as I know how to say them. First, for the record, I want to make it crystal clear that we firmly believe in and trust a science-based approach to regulating our environment, and we know that climate change is real. See? We also know that responding to climate change will give America a competitive economic advantage in the global marketplace. And second, I want to reject the notion that we're engaged in a zero-sum game, that for one of us to win, the other has to lose, that cleaning and greening our environment means the destruction of jobs. Sometimes it is that way, and it can be that way. But it doesn't have to be that way. And I've got to tell you, it can't be that way anymore because it tears us apart. And we need to be together. We're stronger together. And we can't ever allow ourselves to be divided. You see, working people, especially people in poor communities, can't bear the cost of tackling climate change alone. And it would be wrong to ask us to bear that burden all alone. And quite frankly, politically, it won't work. The reality is that we need each other. We have to be able to rely on each other. We have to be able to, to both know what it means to walk in each other's shoes and to tell each other the truth. See, I understand the desperation of the scientific community faced with the prospect of runaway global warming. But the only path to success lies in the scientific and environmental community having a similar understanding of the desperation of unemployed construction workers and laid off manufacturing workers and devastated coal communities. See? When we understand both the climate crisis and the job crisis, together we can set our sights on more projects, like the Transportation and Jobs for America project developed by the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. This is a kind of blue-green partnership bringing together the, the Brookings Institute, a number of universities, and a coalition of trade unions and community groups, including the Blue-Green Alliance. This project levels the playing field for high road employers bidding on rail cars and bus manufacturing procurements by incentivizing commitments to good jobs, domestic production, and a long-term investment in disadvantaged communities. Let me give you another example of the kind of support for one other, for another that can build our relationship. Just last month, I took part in a rally in West Virginia challenging a company called Patriot Coal, which is about the worst named company that I've ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was a company that was formed by Peabody Coal and Arch Coal that go back 
over a hundred years. There were songs written about Peabody Coal in the 30s when they were totally raping the landscape down there. And Mr. Peabody was carrying it away. So this company was formed by Peabody and Arch and rigged to fail. So Peabody could shed its pension liabilities and obligations to coal miners who made that company rich. See, Peabody transferred all of their legacy costs into Little Patriot Coal, undercapitalized it and knew it would go under. And when it did, they would say, gee, it's too bad. 100 years of promises don't matter. Now, no company called Patriot should ever do what Patriot has done. Patriot Coal stands for everything wrong in America right now. And quite frankly, working people are sick of it. So I went to a rally at a bankruptcy court in West Virginia, and thousands of miners were there and thousands of other workers and supporters. And I got to tell you, it was beautiful and it was inspiring. Everybody standing up together. And it gave me a lot of hope. And you know, you understand this is personal for me because I was a coal miner, uh, just like my father and both of my grandfathers. Well, I have to say, I was absolutely thrilled to see Van Jones from Green for All call out Patriot Coal on television and to see Bloomberg opinion column by the environmentalist Bill McKibben uh, who made the argument that it isn't good for anyone, not for anyone in America, for coal companies to treat working people and retirees like this. Now, I don't always agree with everything that Bill writes, but I felt really good to see an environmentalist stand up for the rights of coal miners. See, that's what real and productive relationships are built on. And I hope that the environmentalists feel good when they see a coal miner like me standing up for the environment, saying you're not going to do this anymore. You see, labor and environmentalists are real good friends to have in a peach, in a pinch, truly are. The investments we make in this relationship are going to pay huge dividends down the road. See, it's time for us to take our commitments to each other to new heights. And right now, to be completely frank with you, our alliance is too often too fragile in too many places. We shouldn't be letting the things that we disagree with divide us. We should be grabbing hold of with all our might and bringing the thousands and thousands of things that unite us together and focusing on them. And we have a real chance today. And ironically, we have a real chance to come together and do some good stuff because of our vulnerability. If you look around at the, the fault lines in American politics, you'll see that institutions that safeguard America's environment are under serious attack. And if you look around, you understand that working people are under serious attack. See, the anti-regulation crowd is out to destroy job safety and labor rights protections just as much as it wants to tear apart environmental protections. And we can all duck down into a defensive crouch, or we can step up, we can get up, and we can stand together and lock our arms together and say, not only is this wrong, but this is wrong. And instead of talking about my issues or your issues, we ought to be talking about our issues, because that's exactly what they are. <laughs> See, 
See, we can look with clear eyes at the things that might divide us, pipelines and coal mines or whatever else, and then join forces to put our priorities together because I know that what we share is greater, a thousandfold greater than any issue that we might quibble with over here or over there. See, when it comes down to it, the Blue-Green Coalition is joined at the hip, whether we like it or we don't. And the more we acknowledge that and build on it, the better off both of us will be, the better off uh, working families will be, and the better off the environment that we all share will be. So what do you say we get together and change Washington? Let's unite in a way that makes the pundits' head spin. I think we can do it. I want to do it. I think you want to do it as well. Let's get together and show those pundits what we can really do and how we can change the country for the better. God bless and thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rich Trumka. Rich is an inspiring leader for working people, but now we have some inspiring working people themselves. Around the country, building superintendents play a vital role in reducing energy waste. In New York City, the members of SEIU Local 32BJ have been at the forefront of the Green Supers movement. This movement is a cooperative effort between property managers, 32BJ members, union staff, and New York City's greenest superintendents. Participating property managers send their supers to a rigorous 40-hour core course that covers all aspects of green building operations and maintenance. Today, we're proud to have with us members of SEIU here to talk about how their work is reducing waste and helping to address climate change by reducing carbon. Okay. Thank you very much. We are really pleased to be here today. And to all the diehards that have hung in for this whole conference, give yourself a round of applause. It's an, been an incredible, awesome conference. So I want to introduce the people who are standing up here, and then two of us will make a few comments about um, 32BJ's commitment to really the vision that President Trump laid out, which is the long-term partnership between the labor movement and the environmental movement. So uh, Richie Grandy is a lead cleaner at NYU, a member of 32BJ, and on and uh, took a class at our training fund on green cleaning, and now is an instructor at our training fund on green cleaning. Richie. Ron Wade is a uh, cleaner in the New York City Public Schools. He's on the union, elected member of our executive board. And we're not only fighting in the New York, with the Department of Education in the city schools uh, around our workplace issues of wages and benefits, but also battling PCBs and asbestos as part of our fight to make the schools safe, not only for the workers, but for the kids and the public who use those schools. Ron? James Berry is a part of the faculty and the staff of our training uh, fund, and that is funded by employer contributions. It's part of a labor management partnership that our union has bargained with the real estate industry in New York that now provides training for uh, thousands, tens of thousands of members in the mid-Atlantic region. So James is on the green team and our training fund. Uh, and the, the uh, first part of our presentation is going to be by Victor Nazario, who is a uh, one of our green supers. He's a resident manager in a residential building in New York City, and um, he's going to share a little bit about his personal journey and experiences with us. So, Victor. Hi, my name is Victor Nazario. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. I'm currently the superintendent in an upscale, high-rise building in Midtown Manhattan. I've been a superintendent for about 22 years now. 
I'm also an instructor at the 32BJ Thomas Shortman Training Fund since 2010, as well as a certified Building Performance Institute, or BPI, proctor. I mention this because I was a doorman who became a student at the fund. There I learned all about becoming a successful superintendent. However, I never thought that I would have the privilege of teaching at the school that gave me the tools that I needed to succeed in my chosen profession. Being a superintendent was what I wanted to do, and I succeeded, thank, uh, thank God for the school. And this is what I trained for, but an instructor and a proctor, it had simply never entered my mind. I thought that I had learned pretty much everything I needed to know until I retire. However, all that changed when I was asked by Douglas Elliman Property Management several years ago if I would be willing to take a new course at Thomas Shortman Training Fund called the Thousand Green Superintendents Course. Frankly, I am thrilled that I did. For years, I had known in a general sense what it was that a superintendent did and that it was very important. But it didn't dawn on me just how much we can save the building by being proactive and by, by saving the building money and by presenting and applying several key newer technologies that are readily available and that we can help to make the building safer and healthier for the tenants that we serve. We were taught on the efficient use of lighting, newer energy saving, light fixtures, lighting controls, safe management uh, of the mechanical and heating systems, and the minimizing of water use. Since the building that I work at is 28 years old, the process of retrofitting the building was exciting to me, and it taught me that there are real, viable, affordable options, and that I can be a great help in that process. I realized that I can be very useful in a fresh, new, and effective way. Superintendents many times get into ruts because they're always in the same building, doing the same things, dealing with the same tenants. We all love our tenants, every single one of them, of course. <laughs> but the training also shared with us the philosophy and history of greening buildings and why it's so important to this generation, as well as the future. I learned that my actions today will have a direct impact on my children and grandchildren in their tomorrow. So the training gave me uh, the expanded thinking, and it gave me a greater perspective of my chosen profession. Frankly, it expanded me. It excited me. Now we're talking about purpose and a future, a perspective that declares that my actions today are positively impacting the quality of life and health of my tenants, and collectively, we're lessening the energy demand or footprint of the building. Thus, we're not wasting the Earth's resources. Someone once said, we do not inherit the Earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. With this new training and information, I was able to have the privilege of working together with the board of managers at the Whitney Condominiums in Midtown Manhattan to apply some of these newly learned strategies so that they can save money in the process, lessen the electrical demand of the building, and make the building a cleaner and safer place for our residents. And finally, I have been given the privilege to be the valedictorian for our graduating class, and that was so cool because I spoke after Secretary Chu. What a privilege that was. I, to be part of an instructional video and now teach my fellow superintendents the green course, uh, the green buildings course. Simply amazing. I never thought that this would have been, uh, that I would ever have this privilege, but thanks to the Thomas Shortman Training Fund, not only am I a more effective superintendent, I'm also a small part of teaching others to do, that, to do the very same thing. I close by uh, referencing a quote by Gaylord Nelson, the co-founder of Earth Day, he said this, the ultimate test of man's conscience may be his willingness to sacrifice something today for future generations whose words of thanks will not be heard. Thank you for the opportunity to share my experience with you today. Victor's story really is the story of what's possible in our unions and in our movement where um, we can both find ways to bring the labor movement and the environmental movement to make our workplaces greener. In this case, we have a partnership with the real estate industry that allows us and supports this program of green supers. We have, he's one of 2,000 uh, superintendents and resident managers that have graduated and participated in this program and as part of that been exposed to climate change and the environmental movement. And for us at 32BJ, we're part of SEIU and part of a larger organization that's, that believes, as President Trump has said, that we have to be about building a movement that, that brings together for the long term a partnership between labor and the environmental movement. That we think about 
how we fight for and create a sustainable world that's sustainable for the natural world and sustainable for the, the humans that live within it. And that we think about all the ways that we do that in the workplace and outside of the workplace, whether it's through pension fund investments for the millions and billions of dollars that our, pen our pension funds control, whether it's through getting out and advocating and participating uh, in important issues to make our world sustainable, whether it's responding, thinking about how we respond to climate change, to the hur Hurricane Sandy, and to the other challenges that are before us. But in, that we have to challenge ourselves in the labor movement to think about how sustainability and the fight for uh, a sustainable world is something that's important because our members live in communities affected by asthma, by cancer, by um, toxic waste, and in many cases, um, the environmental justice movement is an important ally for us. And in the environmental movement, we have to think about how we come together and think about corporate greed and the impact that corporate greed has on the natural world and the environment. And so we have a lot in common and a lot to work uh, to work together with and just want to leave you with, that, with this challenge for both of us that we look for the ways in common that we can build a large and growing progressive movement that's committed to sustainable natural environments and a, and a sustainable world for, uh, with good jobs and a real future for all of us. Thank you very much. We're going to wrap up with a final panel discussion, a great panel, I might say, on how environmental and labor innovation are boosting the bottom line in the nation's economy. As we've repeatedly heard through this conference, we know that it's a false argument to say we must choose between a healthy environment and a strong economy. As Leo Girard often reminds us, it's both or neither. Here to open the panel for us is a man who helped start the Blue-Green Alliance. In the very beginning, Carl Pope, at that time executive director of the Sierra Club. We could not have begun this partnership without Carl's leadership. Carl served with the Sierra Club for over 30 years. In that time, he served as its political director, conservation director, executive director, and finally chairman. During his tenure as executive director, the Sierra Club added 400,000 new members and supporters. Since he stepped down in 2012, Carl has gone on to become an independent consultant and principal of Inside Straight Strategies, working on the intersection of sustainability and economic development. Carl? Well, we're coming to the end of this wonderful conference, and it's all about the bottom line, not just the financial bottom line, but the human dignity bottom line, the strong families bottom line, and the environmental sustainability bottom line. We have a fantastic panel here, and they're going to talk about their experiences, very different and very varied experiences, all adding up to a powerful narrative of how we build the kind of partnerships and alliances that President Trumpka talked about. So we've got Tom Conway, the International Vice President of the United Steelworkers, Roger Kilmer, the director of the Manufacturing Extension Partnership at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Daniel Cruz, the global vice president of Alcoa. Mike Robinson, the vice president for sustainability and global regulatory affairs at General Motors. And finally, Terry Shanahan, the vice president of sustainability for International Paper. So I'm actually going to ask each of our panelists to talk for about three minutes from their own experience about why they took time from their busy schedules, and these people all have really crazy schedules, I know, because I've been listening to their travel schedules, why they wanted to take the time out from their schedules to come and share their experiences with you about how building a new, clean economy is also the way to building a really solid bottom line. Tom, you want to begin? Yeah, Carl. Um, look, for our union, as you know, as we've gone through these days and as we've gone through the founding of the um, Blue Green Alliance together with Carl's organization at the time, 
Uh, for us, this has always been a crucial issue. If you, sort of the history of the steel work, because a lot of times we'll talk about um, how it helps us in jobs and how in steels and aluminums and, and really what had traditionally been dirty, dirty industries we've cleaned up. But in the very foundation of our union, back when the steel workers were in their infancy, in Denora, Pennsylvania, there was an event, a weather event, called the Denora Death Fog. And one of the companies who was working there in the valley, um, the weather came in in such a way that the pollution dumped into the valley, killed 20 people nearly immediately, hundreds of people got sick, and the employer and the community um, officials sort of wanted to sit back and say, well, that was a bad day, wasn't it? Um, no, one, no one really wanted to take responsibility. And the steel workers, for the first time, a labor organization, stepped up and funded a study to prove what had happened and that the pollution escaping this plant caused those deaths and really was just unsustainable, both for the workers in the plant, for the community, for the people who lived around it. And from that day forward, the steel workers were sort of open to these issues, understood their importance, um, worked on them, and, and it carries us forward today. We do, we say all the time, we can have good jobs and we can have a clean environment and, and we look to enforce that in our labor agreements and, and where we have an opportunity. Daniel, you, your company sometimes sits on the opposite side of the bargaining table from Tom, but you've also found ways to collaborate around some of these other broader issues. From Alcoa's <coughs> perspective, why is being a good environmental citizen a good business practice? I mean, I think the, you look at our, our industry and you look at the resurgence of, manufa of American manufacturing, which you're, you're talking about, and you look at what the aluminum business and Alcoa specifically is now doing in the United States, and not only are we doing well in the United States, but what we are doing is benefiting from this green trend. Right. And so the metal itself is infinitely recyclable, it's light and it's strong, and 75% of you know, all aluminum ever made is still being recycled. I have to use that statistic every time uh, we speak. 75% of all the aluminum ever made is still being ever used. made. Now that's sustainability. That's <laughs> and, uh, and a can, and, you know, a water can or a Coke can, uh, if recycled, is back on the shelf within 60 days. And that can uses 95% less energy to make if recycled than if made from the raw ore. Which is so the, the metal itself is incredibly recyclable, and it's now becoming part of. I see a I see a laptop, uh, Apple laptop there. It's becoming part of consumer electronics. It's becoming part of phones. It's becoming part of you know building facades, and it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of both planes and autos. Mm -hmm. And on the plane side, we we just uh, invested in in Lafayette, right. uh, oh, created a you know, plant you know well, created uh, 75 jobs there. And on the plane side, you have now the big single aisle workhorses from both Airbus and Boeing that are aluminum intensive. And that you know, saves them 10% uh, weight, 20% fuel efficiency. And the eight years of backlog on commercial airplanes that we're seeing is very positive for our bottom line. And the same thing on autos, and, 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 and you see that. On autos, more and more of not only of the, the, the in, in part thanks to the CAFE standards, more and more of the auto parts have become aluminum. So that now it used to be the radiator, it used to be the, the, the engine block, it's now the hood, it's now the entire frame, it's now the doors, it's now even the casing for the batteries and the hybrids mm -hmm. or the electrical cars. And there, and, and then Tom, you know this as well, in Davenport, Iowa, we just invested $300 million creating 150 jobs uh, to uh, respond to the, to the increase in, in auto demand. So for us, it's a good story. It's a green story, it's a good story, and we're looking at aluminum demand doubling by 2020, uh, and, it's, and it's green growth. So we're, we're happy, and that's why I thought it was important to be here today. Great, thank you. Moving down the supply chain, what's it life like at the new General Motors, Mike? Well, it's an, exciting, it's an exciting time to be part of this company, um, Carl, and, and you know the history of, of uh, a lot of uh, our products and a lot of our practices. I want to finish on a point Daniel was just making, though. Um, when we can take 10% uh, mass out of a vehicle uh, by using lighter weight materials, we basically get about a 6.5% improvement in fuel economy. 
Um, so it's almost a one-for-one -one type of a trade-off, uh, which is huge. And, and so you're going to see a lot more aluminum in, in vehicles and other lightweight materials. Um, and, you know, a lot of our R&D time is spent figuring out how to use more and more materials that traditionally haven't been used in vehicles uh, because it's transparent to the customer. The customer doesn't care as long as the vehicle does everything the vehicle is supposed to do. Uh, so if we can get those kinds of improvements, it makes sense for everybody. Um, it's, been a, it's been a great three years since we went through this awful baptism of reorganization that we had to go through as a company. And I, I think through that ordeal, um, the, the company has come out uh, much stronger, much better, financially stronger, better with our relationships with our unions and with, uh, with our partners uh, that are NGOs. And I think um, I would share this with you in this group. I think a lot of the work we're able to accomplish together has been a function of the dysfunction that we've ex all experienced in Washington. And I think out of necessity, we have figured out ways to get things done together that we maybe haven't been so successful getting done in the past. So I view it as a tremendous opportunity going forward uh, for all of us. And um, uh, I'll, I'll steal ahead a little bit in terms of why this is important to me. I, I got to know the Blue Green Alliance during the fuel economy um, negotiations about started about three years ago. And what we, I think, found together was that our power together to solve problems was far greater than our power was separately trying to beat each other. Um, and, and once we realized where the common ground was, man, it was great to be able to figure out where we could go with that. So for us, this has been a huge benefit uh, from a relationship standpoint, from a problem solving standpoint. So Roger, tell me, you're the one person from Washington that we invited up on the stage. Actually, I live in Gaithersburg, Maryland, but oh, that's... Oh, you live in Gaithersburg. <laughs> well, nobody... Well, that is crazy. <coughs> but, so tell us about your perspective and, and what, sure. what intrigued you about this workshop and where you think we might be going together. Uh, absolutely. So let me talk a little bit about the, the, the program that I direct. Uh, it's called the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. And I'll come back to the partnership piece because it is a key uh, piece of, of what we do. So I've got a network of centers around the country that work with the small and medium-sized manufacturers that, that are all suppliers to these mm -hmm. other folks here. Uh, for us, in, in dealing with the small folks, uh, they really need a, a lot of help, a lot of education on, on what's possible. Uh, they need to understand the supply chains that they work in and how they can contribute to those folks. And so our centers are out there working hand in hand with these manufacturers to understand the benefits, uh, not only from the social side of it, but certainly from the business side of what that mm -hmm. means to their, their bottom line and the kind of ROI that they can see uh, by implementing some of these, these, these clean technologies. Uh, certainly from, again, the partnership piece of it, uh, I like to think of us as very different than a lot of the rest of the federal government or what perception you might have uh, in that we're, we try to be very business focused uh, we really do try and partner with as many organizations as possible, both at the national level, other federal agencies, the Department of Energy, EPA, et cetera, uh, and also at the local level. Our centers really rely on those organizations that have got that expertise uh, that can help uh, the small and medium-sized manufacturers. So, for example, with the uh, Clean Energy Manufacturing Center, uh, we've done a lot of work with them in terms of outreach. A lot of it is educational at this point, helping uh, our small, our clients, our small manufacturers really understand what the benefits are to them uh, and to the environment and to the economy uh, in doing these things. For our program, we're really focused, if you will, on the bottom line that the clients see. Mm -hmm. So we're focused on what they can achieve in doing these things through cost savings. Uh, but I can also tell you that jobs are an important component of this. And what we see at an annual level for my network of centers across the country is the ability to either retain or create about 60,000 jobs every year, mm -hmm. which is an important part of that. Yeah. Terry, for the, you're sort of at the opposite extreme from Alcoa. You have a product which is not infinitely recyclable, but it's renewable. And I don't think 75% of the paper ever made in the world is still being turned into newsprints. What's the, from your perspective of different kind of company, What's this world of sustainability look like? How do you make sure. yourself sustainable? Thanks, Carl. And you're right. Um, you know, we are the only, we represent the only 
uh, renewable way that humans can communicate. Um, so we're very proud of this record we have of more than 100 years of being the reason that millions of acres of land uh, remains as forested land. And you know, this whole discussion is really focused on climate change. And one of the reasons I'm delighted to be part of the conversation, and there are really three reasons, but the first one would be that um, there are some really large things connected to climate change, and forests are certainly one of those. And as the world's largest forest products manufacturer, we have a, a special connection to the forests of the world and, um, and a special responsibility that goes along with that as well. So, um, so that's kind of the first natural reason for wanting to be here is that whenever we're talking about climate change, you know, there's a very natural connection. Um, and green jobs are, are sort of part of who we are. Um, the second reason is just who you are. Um, the, you, the people here you know, represent two incredibly important constituents for us and stakeholders in what we do and who we are. Um, but you're also part of the third reason, which is we've been as a company and certainly also as an industry um, pretty silent for as much as maybe 20 years. We've been really disengaged. And we kind of thought, well, we're just going to keep our heads down and do our jobs and be busy and focus on making money. And everybody will trust that we're just doing the right thing. And everybody will just know that we have a good story and you know, it's all about um, doing the right thing. But what we've learned, what we've realized only in the last you know, maybe couple of years here is that during the time that we were just so focused on all of that and just kind of quietly doing our jobs and going about our business, um, you know, some misperceptions and were forming about us and about what we do and who we are. And some concerns were forming about what we do and who we are. And we weren't answering those concerns or those questions. So a big part of what we've undertaken just in the last couple of years is an effort to engage and have dialogue and talk about who we are. And then the final reason is we want to get better. We're, we're proud of where we are, but we're not satisfied. And we're becoming convinced that we can't get better just by ourselves. We probably can get better a little bit by pushing ourselves, but we need you to push us as well. We need external stakeholders to really challenge the way we think about ourselves. So Carl, those would be kind of the reasons that it, it feels like it makes perfect sense um, for International Paper to be part of this, but we're awfully glad we are. Thanks. Thanks. Tom, you represent an industrial union. In fact, at this point, you represent the quintessential mm -hmm. industrial union. But that process by which steel and rubber and oil and chemicals and atomic and paper came together was also over a period of about 20 years. When I think it's fair to say the United States government says we don't have to manufacture anymore. Yeah. Can you talk about what you would say to people in Washington today about what they need to do to bring back the manufacturing base that helped make this country great? We when we think about manufacturing, you think about the economy and, and, um, and with all of these companies, we have relationships with every one of these companies and, and even at General Motors, not pure UAW, we have had direct contract relationships with GM over the years and try and bring that forward. So, so manufacturing companies and the MEP program that we've worked closely with in a lot of states trying to help our smaller manufacturers survive and transition to a green economy has been important. For us, it's kind of simple. We've watched our GDP, which used to be 26, 27% based on manufacturing, fall almost to the single digits, 10%. And where financial services in our country used to be eight, nine, 10% designed to support manufacturing and the R&D associated with manufacturing, it's completely reversed. And now you find financial services sort of leading GDP and manufacturing fall to this small level. And frankly, we don't believe you can build a sustainable economy on selling each other financial services, on charging each other fees. And so, so if you don't, if you don't, and, and the word extraction is a tough word, we understand that, but if you don't do good, clean, honest extraction, mine it, mill it, put capital and labor against something, add value and take it to a market. That's how you build a sustained economy. And that's how we think manufacturing plays an important role in our economy. And the hoodwinking of the last 30 years of financial services 
has collapsed. We've seen it occur, you know, since the first half of 2008, and, it's, and things aren't getting better in terms of jobs. So the ability to return jobs back to the U.S. is crucial, and this country needs to say to itself, this outsourcing of our manufacturing and this hollowing out of good manufacturing communities is it really good for our nation as a whole? And it's, so it's a fight we're always in. And together with, um, with the environmental community, I think we're continually moving that along. Roger, what, what's, what, when you bring your lessons, the lessons you learned going around the country, back to Washington, do you think Washington really gets it? Well, let, let me say, for the first time in the roughly 20 years that I've been in the program, uh, this last year and a half is the first time that I've actually heard the word manufacturing spoken, spelled correctly, <laughs> and, and used in, inside D.C. It really has been a realization based on the economic issues that the country's been facing that manufacturing is really the path to solve the, those issues, both in terms of the economy and in terms of jobs. Uh, and so it's been refreshing for me managing a program that's involved with manufacturing to have those kinds of conversations, regardless of where it is in the federal government, uh, wherever it is uh, in Congress on the Hill. Uh, they now understand that manufacturing is a key aspect uh, to be able to address and solve some of those issues. Complicated, though, because when you look at manufacturing and you look at uh, how we're structured in the, in, in the federal government, uh, there's lots of bits and pieces and components in every federal agency that's here. So a lot of, of what uh, the administration has been doing, a lot of what I've been doing, a lot of the other federal agencies, is how do we work together to really get that coherent, cohesive uh, solution and approaches to helping manufacturing generally? So it goes everything from the education to the finance to the technology and, and on and on and on, uh, certainly the clean energy pieces. Uh, how do you bring all those together in a way that uh, can benefit manufacturing? And in my case, especially for those small and medium-sized guys who really have a hard time understanding where they can find things and how they can use it to the best of their advantage. Daniel, aluminum is a wonderful metal, but the aluminum business hasn't always been a wonderful business to be in. And you guys have faced some real challenges. I'm curious if you could use Roger's services here to communicate your message to Washington what does the aluminum industry and its supply chain really need from the government to be able to thrive and be more sustainable and take advantage of the wonderful properties you described for your metal? I think one of the, you know, one of the things we're looking at, and, and again, Tom is familiar with, uh, with, with this plan, in Messina, New York, and the, the first part, the autos and the aerospace is kind of the advanced technology and what we're, we're really building off of. But the core of our business is making the metal. And we have this smelter in upstate New York. It's the oldest smelter in our global system, 120 years old. And, um, and we are now, we just uh, announced last weekend that we were investing in upstate New York to modernize that smelter, keep the thousands or so jobs that are, that are there. And, uh, and that's because in part it's clean energy, it's hydro energy, so mm -hmm. completely clean. And two, it's one of the best uh, energy deals that we have in the world right here in upstate New York. And then you see another part in the, the middle part when we make the, the before we get the, the alumina to the smelter, we make, it, we make it through a refinery. We have a refinery in Point Comfort, Texas, uh, a refinery that we had essentially written off. And now that refinery, thanks to LNG, is uh, probably the third most competitive in our system. Right. So I think one of the message that we bring to Washington is that this energy revolution is incredibly important. And specifically on the LNG side, let's be you know, measured in, in how we decide what our export policies are. You mean you would not want to ship it all overseas? We would not. We wouldn't be against doing some exporting, but let's be balanced about it. Okay. Mike, General Motors is a global corporation. And when you look at those, the issues of sustainability through the global lens. You don't just have to worry about what the issues are here in the United States. You've got major operations in China, you've got major operations in Europe, in Latin America. Right. What are the differences that you see in the way it, what does it mean to operate as General Motors in some of these other countries when you come to dealing with these environmental issues? Are they ahead of us or are we ahead of them? <laughs> What's it look like? Well, we're at a different stage, but um, I think the world is a different place than it was in many respects. The communication age has changed a lot, and it, what it's changed is the instant 
understanding that a place like China has about what's going on in Europe or going on in the United States, whether it's fuel economy regulation, CO2 reduction at plants, mm -hmm. what have you. Um, but we are still, I think, uh, in a much more evolved place um, in terms of our thinking on the subject than a lot of places that we do business. And one of the things we do, just so you guys know this, is um, you know our internal standards aren't just to comply with the law. Our, our internal standards are we're going to operate a plant in China the way we would operate a plant in Michigan uh, for the most part. Our standards don't vary. Um, we realize the long-term importance of that. One, one of the things I'd like to um, mention, though, is you know uh, there's been a, a couple of references to energy. And one of you know, the things on my mind as I come to a conference like this, and, and I'll, I'll tell you my selfish motivation for this is, about a month ago, my, my CEO gave a speech in which he said something really, really provocative, so commonsensical that nobody could deny it makes sense. Yet, <clears throat> we're not doing it. And that is to talk about a truly comprehensive, economy-wide national energy policy that gets at these fits and starts we seem to have. Uh, we're dealing, you know, the, the the uh, Energy Information Agency says that by 2020 we're going to be a shipper of, of, of natural gas. We're going to be we're going to we're going to be shipping natural gas out of this country. We ought to be thinking about from a position of strength. How do we have labor unions, NGOs, manufacturers, utilities, energy providers, and renewable energy providers sitting down at the table and hammering out a long-term plan? Every president since Nixon has talked about this, and nobody's done it. And unless we decide it's important to us, it's not going to happen. So what we've said is we ought to be thinking about this from the standpoint of improving the standard of living um, in America. And that means a couple of things. It's not about cash in the pocket by itself. It's about affordable, uh, consistently available, uh, uh, cleaner water, cleaner air, um, lower CO2, better trade balance, and balanced budget. Those things can be accomplished, but we have to decide we want to do it. I'm going to do a quick little scientific survey here. And you're off, you can go off the government clock for this purpose. Mm, <laughs> turn the cameras off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I want each of you to raise, that, 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 that comment sounds very much like what we heard from President Trumpka who said we need an energy and jobs plan in this country. And we've heard people talk about a manufacturing strategy. Right. And all of this involves the idea that the United States should actually act on these issues with intention, not just randomly. Right. So I want each of you to raise your hand and you can show zero to five fingers for how important you think it is for the future success of the things you care about that the United States <laughs> get such an approach. How important is it that we actually develop a long-range national strategy for how we deal with our economy and the environment? Zero to five fingers. If, if we're thinking beyond the next couple of years? Yes. Right. 20 years out. 20 years out. <laughs> and he's actually a very careful man. <laughs> you can tell me privately later. Okay. Terry, uh, you represent a company that cuts down trees, and there are a fair number of people in this audience who love trees. And what would you... Uh... <laughs> Have you got anybody in particular in mind, Carl? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I probably know several. <laughs> so I'd like you, you told me a story about your operations in India, which I thought were a good example, and that might be an opportunity to share a side of your company and your business with the people in the Blue Green Alliance that they don't get. So would you talk a little bit about what you told me to learn about India? Yeah, I'd be delighted to, Carl. And, and you know, I said in the, in the earlier um, start of the program that, you know, part of what we're committed to doing is, is talking and having conversation and telling our story uh, and hopefully also having a better story to tell because we're becoming a better company. But certainly we've got to communicate. And while we share concerns about the force of the world, I mean, if you think about it, it just makes sense. We need trees as our key raw materials. So if we just simply you know, use them up and don't replant them, then we're going to run out of them pretty quickly. We've been in business for 115 years, and all of that time we've been in the business of being responsible for creating the reason for forests to exist. 
So it's, it's really taking the story and just turning it right around on its head. And it's a hard conversation, but I've had it with a lot of people and, um, and you know, they kind of walk away saying, gee, I just never thought about it like that before. So, so I'd ask each of you to think about it as you know, a little bit of the opposite of what you might worry about, which is, oh, gee, if I use this piece of paper, then somebody, or this corrugated box or whatever it is, then somebody had to go cut down a tree. And the reality is that most of the forests of the world are working forests, so they earn a living, just like all of us have to do. Those acres of land have to earn a living. Um, and in the U.S., that's even higher. It's almost 70% in the U.S. So our forests are working forests. Um, now, the, India is a neat story um, that I shared with Carl earlier. We have operations on five continents, and um, just a couple of years ago, we got into the Indian market. And um, it's just a, a really neat um, operation there. <coughs> what we have are two paper mills. And what we do for, in terms of sourcing those mills with wood is we use a species of wood that is capable of growing in soil that won't support anything else. So you can't graze cattle, you can't grow crops of any kind. It's essentially kind of like sand. And there's a tree that will grow in such soil. It's called a casarina tree. It grows to about between 20 and 30 feet tall in just four to six years. So it's really rapidly growing. And this tree is very spindly. It's only sort of this big around and doesn't have a lot of branches. It's kind of perfect to make pulpwood out, out of to make either paper or um, board that is used for packaging. And um, so, you know, we have a program in place where it, we have suppliers of wood to these two mills. Now, it's really kind of astonishing because there are 40,000 families who are now involved in tree farming to support these two paper mills. And each one of them owns an average of about one and a half acres of land. So it's just an incredibly small plot of land. But what that has meant to them is that they went from subsistence living with no housing and you know, really extremely um, poor conditions. And now they have housing and they have an ongoing sustainable way to make a living. And it's really an amazing difference in the quality of their life. And what we do is we provide the seedlings to these families essentially for free. And then they sell the wood back to us when it's mature and ready to grow. So we've taken land that you know, really couldn't be used for any other um, good purpose and made it into tree farms. Um, so we are delighted with that outcome. But we're also very pleased and, and you know, feel very positive about the impact we have on forest uh, around the globe because, again, it's a story of ensuring that these forests have an economic reason to exist, more so than worrying about cutting down you know, a particular tree. It's giving the entire forest that reason to exist. My GM made a big, bold bet on electrification with the Volt. Yep. What have you, what's been positive about that experience, what's been challenging, and what does it tell you about the future of innovation in the transportation sector? Um, you're right, it was a big bet, and it's, it's getting bigger because we're committed to it. Um, the, the product, by the way, uh, if you haven't driven it, you should. Let me um, ask you a question. How many people here have driven a Volt or another electric car? Good. That's good. Um, it, I love getting people inside the vehicle, Carl, because it, if they aren't anticipating it and they don't know about what they're going to experience, the, the driving experience is second to none. I mean, the torque is there, the, the driving performance is there. It feels more like a sporty car than it does uh, in a, in a vehicle with great fuel efficiency. But um, it's, part of, it's part of a lot of different technologies, that, that the portfolio that we've put together to address uh, climate change, to address uh, uh, fuel and energy uh, uh, independence, really, in this country. In the next five years or less, you're going to see from us about 500,000 uh, electrified vehicles of one type or another on the road. The Volt is going to be accompanied with that technology with a Cadillac product called the ELR. Um, you're going to see a pure battery electric vehicle sold primarily at first in California and Oregon called the Spark battery electric vehicle. Again, it'll blow your socks off. It's so good. Um, and it'll be less expensive than the current Volt. These are important technologies to us because not only are they important to meet <clears throat> the demands of, of, of basically the, the energy demands that we all face, 
But I think the technology embedded within these vehicles is American know-how at its best. Yesterday we had uh, an event, small little event, near here in White Marsh Township, uh, Maryland, where we've decided to make our own electric motors to support the battery electric vehicles and uh, the control systems for those vehicles. Um, and, and that's a huge bet because we're not going to buy them off the shelf from a Japanese company. That would be the cheaper thing to do initially, but not in the long run. Because not only can we develop the motors better with our own employees um, here in Maryland, but uh, we develop the know-how here. And it becomes a core competency of our workers and our engineers. So we're thinking long term. And this, to me, the, the, the beauty of the Volt is it's the number one, by the way, the number one rated vehicle by consumer reports in terms of customer satisfaction. Mm -hmm. The customer experience with that vehicle has been second to none, the highest ratings they've ever recorded on that vehicle. And that's not accidental. It's because it's a really good vehicle. And people are really getting delivered to them what they wanted when they, when they leased or bought that vehicle. But there's a lot of learning that's coming out of that. And you know, it's the best vehicle we make aerodynamically. Well, that's turned into learning with other vehicles. Um, we're going to be doing a lot with lightweighting materials. We're going to be doing a lot with electrification in various forms, whether it's a pure BEV or mild hybrids. But you're going to see a lot of electrified vehicles in the next four or five years. So we're a believer. Not everybody is, but that doesn't matter. We think we're right. And uh, those, are, those are going to be American jobs. We've invested about $10 billion in the last three years in U.S., not worldwide, U.S. plants and U.S. jobs. Daniel, you were talking about some of the new uses of aluminum. Looking forward 10 or 15 years, where do you see something that the audience would not expect to Indeed. see as a use for aluminum? Where, where do you think there's something new coming over the horizon with your lightweight, infinitely recyclable metal? Um, well, we like we like the Volt, and and we like the the electrical cars in general. On the Volt, uh, you, know, you have Alcoa wheels on the Volt, and and, and it's uh, aluminum intensive. And we we're looking at four times uh, the the production of aluminum auto sheet in the United States. We're looking at quadrupling that demand next uh, until twenty fifteen. Quadrupling that Quadrupling demand. in three years. So it's a big it's a big jump. But one of the products that's fascinating, we have a building and construction business, and we, right. make, we make facades for, for buildings. And you think of the Chrysler Building or the Empire State Building, and they have aluminum, aluminum facade. And the, the next generation of facades that we're, we are currently making, but, and, and we think is you know, a product of the future, is called EcoClean. And EcoClean essentially absorbs smog. Right. So that if you have, 10,000 square feet of eco-clean facade, so a gas station has about that amount of, of surface, uh, the facade, the Alcoa facade, will take in as much CO2 as 80 trees. So that, in fact, you know, you can have this material to build your building that will also uh, clean and the And it does that year after year. And it does it just it keeps on doing year. it. You don't have to cut it and re. Can you uh, tell us how? <laughs> is that a secret? <laughs> <laughs> but that's one. But that's one of the products, and, and we have. But that's one of the products that I think you know um, will will really make a make a difference. Roger, obviously, what we do, what we make in manufacturing facilities is changing, but uh, manufacturing itself is changing, and I guess I think I suspect many of us kind of have these images in our head of. You know, pictures of the River Rouge plant in World War right. II right. or a exactly. Bessemer steel conversion plant. What, what's happening that's new and exciting in the actual way manufacturing is going to be done? Well, certainly from our perspective, it's, it's how technology is playing into this, and that includes clean energy technology, but some of the, some of the other technologies that certainly are in the, in the, in the nano, the coating kinds of things that, that you just mentioned. Um, that, if I can go back to a little bit of, of how DC is starting to learn a lesson uh, on this, it, it goes back to your comment about the know-how. And I think there's a realization now that if you aren't making it, you aren't building it here, uh, you lose a lot of the knowledge and know-how of, of what works and what doesn't to really make those improvements, to create those new ideas. So the innovation and the manufacturing really go hand in glove. Uh, in this, and I think that's a realization that, that folks in D.C. are now seeing. 
uh, that manufacturing is not only important from the economy and the jobs perspective, but for the longer range, the more strategic approach to that, you've got to have those two things uh, uh, pulled together. Uh, I think what we're seeing, and again, this goes to the small and medium-sized manufacturers we deal with, we're working with them to help mine their ideas uh, in, in terms of what those innovations are uh, that can help our larger uh, folks that, that they're supplying to. And I know certainly that, that's been a trend uh, for some period of time where uh, a, a lot of the, the, the innovation, the ideas uh, are being pushed down to the small guys or conversely, we're looking at the small folks to, to, to what are those new creative things that we can bring into play. So. Um, I see uh, uh, there's a bigger role for the small and medium-sized folks. They need a little bit more help uh, because they just don't have all the know-how and expertise and resources to do that, but that's uh, really kind of where we come in to try and help them. Tom, you've, there's been a lot of showcasing at this conference about the steelworkers leadership on environmental issues, creating the Blue-Green Alliance, your long, long record starting with the Donora Smog incident. My guess is that as the American economy has changed and as these sustainability issues have come to the fore, that the steelworkers have had to change the way they approach other aspects of their work, their relationships with the companies, their relationships with government. Can you talk a little bit about what you think is new and changing in the world of the United Steelworkers as a labor union, leaving sustainability aside? Look, these are all technological advances and, and while we have a lot of issues with trade policies, technology costs jobs. When technology comes into the workplace, the workforce has to adjust. First, you've got to learn how to use it. It's going to replace what you've been doing, and it's often going to replace some of you who were working there. It used to be 20 guys with shovels digging a ditch, and someone showed up with a backhoe, and 19 of them were out of work. And the union has to figure out how are you going to deal with that, because if you say we're not gonna let the backhoe in here, you're going out of business. So trying to refuse the advance of technology and the implementation of it is, is a foolish approach for a union, and I think it's, it's a dead end one. So over the years, you know, we, we've talked about, in 1980, I think our nation had right at about 100 blast furnaces operating. Now, I would think we're in the 21, 22 in operation right now. But we're making as much iron in those 22 furnaces as we made in 100 furnaces in 1980 due to a lot of advance in technology, due to a lot of change in the way work practices have come about. And it has cost jobs, but, but a union can't afford to just ignore it and be foolish about it. So we've changed with the aluminum industry, we've changed with the auto industry, we've changed, we make high strength, low alloy steels that we put into autos, we make aluminum, that will go into autos and we get caught in the competitiveness about those two materials. We're closely with the paper industry and, and we're not afraid of technology changes. We, it's a reality that you have to face and if you're gonna build a good manufacturing based economy, you, you just have to train your workforce and be prepared. And so our insistence is when you're introducing a technology we may lose some jobs. We'll do our best to find places for folks in, in particular train on that technology. And, and it's been a constant change for us. But if you're not willing to constantly change, you're just gonna be out of the game. All right, we're gonna do one more round and I'm gonna set it up. So <laughs> one of the things I think is impressive about this panel is you haven't heard a single one of them make a single excuse for why they didn't do something they knew they should do. Nobody's pointed the finger at anybody else. Nobody's blamed things beyond their control for the problems that they faced. Now, we sit in the nation's capital of finger pointing. So I'm gonna give each one of them a chance not to finger point, but to say one or two sentences that if they could really make every key elected decision maker in Washington absorb, mm -hmm. what would your one or two key sentences be? 
And I'm actually, because I didn't prepare them for this, so it's, <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> I'm going <coughs> to offer you mine first, and then we'll go to Terry, and then we'll go around. My sentence would be that when we elected you to public office, Senator, Congressman, Mr. President, you auditioned for the job of doing the public's business. You did not audition for the job of getting reelected. I think you need to shift your priorities. <laughs> OK, and it's true, he didn't give us any <laughs> advance notice of this. Um, you know, mine is going to be on, on my, my familiar theme. Um, I read recently in a United Nations report from the Food and Agriculture Organization, and it's, it's online, you can, you can go access it. It's called the State of the Forests. So they're talking about global forestry and, and what's going on with the Earth's forest. As you can tell, this is a really important issue for me. And, and I read in their report a sentence, if I, if I could share, not just with Washington decision makers, but actually with just about anybody. Right. Um, uh, uh, many statements in it, but I'll, I'll just quote one, since we're only allowed a, a brief sort of moment in time here. And that is, um, what it said in the report was, one of the most uh, difficult challenges that the forest products industry faces is to help people understand that the best way to protect a forest is to use it. And that would be what I would share. All right. Mike. Um, I'll keep the sentences short. <laughs> um, think long term. Um, I could say get your heads out of a body part we'd rather not talk about. <coughs> Um, follow the science and cross the damn aisle. Hey. Daniel? Um, I mean, I would say that the, the government is so important in enabling innovation, enabling you know, the rebirth of, of, of manufacturing, in getting the energy picture right. And I think this administration, the president, uh, got a lot of grief uh, in the last few years about their relationship with business and their relationship with, uh, with all businesses in general. And I think that I've seen and I've noticed in the last uh, several months a real uh, shift in tone from the administration. And I think the president himself uh, is, is, has different dialogue with, uh, with the business community. So my message to the, to the White House and the president would be Keep on doing what you're doing, uh, and uh, and we welcome it. Roger. Okay. Um, to me, it goes back to, to kind of our philosophy and the way that, that I work and our program works, and that is, there's a role for everybody. Uh, you've got to understand and value what everybody brings to uh, to the game. Uh, there are no silver bullets in any of this process. There's got to be some give and take. Uh, let's focus on what's good f for everyone and not for the few. Uh, and we've got to do more talking and less finger pointing, as you said. And as is appropriate at a good jobs, green jobs conference, the last <laughs> word goes to the United Steelworkers. <laughs> <laughs> I would tell them quit taking money. The money in this system is corrupting our nation. The Citizens United decision is corrupting our democracy. I think we have politicians who were forced into a system of fundraising that I think in their hearts they don't want to be in, but it's, it's a system there. So if I could tell them to do anything, we'd just, just quit taking the damn money and figure out a different way to do it. <laughs> Let's hear a round of applause for this panel. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Scott Paul, and I'm with the Alliance for American Manufacturing. And I think I have one of the best jobs at the entire Good Jobs, Green Jobs Conference 
introducing our next speaker, Congressman Keith Ellison. And I will get to that in just a couple of minutes. First, let me say a few words, quite literally, about why I think the work that all of you are doing is so important. And really, it's a simple formula for success. Red, white, and blue plus green equals jobs for our future. Let me say it again. That's red, white, and blue plus green equals jobs for our future. And here's what that means. A clean energy economy is a very good thing. But it is only a great thing if it's made in America. And even though, and even though we have some of the most abundant sun and wind and hydro and clean fuels, and even though we have some of the best innovation, the best workers, and the best businesses, there is still no guarantee that we'll be making it in America. The only way we know we'll win these jobs of the future is if we have the best public policies. And that means rebuilding our transit, our bridges, our infrastructure, and making sure our tax dollars are not outsourced overseas. That means using American steel and materials, which are cleaner and greener than other countries. That means ensuring our workers have the skills they need to win these jobs. That means changing the tax code to bring more jobs back home. That means investing in our future through research and development, clean energy, industrial ener energy efficiency, and education. That means changing our trade policy from one based on a simplistic philosophy to one that's based on results and one that ensures a fair deal for our workers, our communities, and our businesses. And I will say that for the first time in a very long time, as, as the panel you heard discuss, I believe there is hope. Because five years ago, hardly anyone was talking about American manufacturing. That's changed, and it's not just Roger Kilmer in the last panel. The cover of last week's Time magazine, Made in America, is manufacturing com coming back. Five years ago, American manufacturing was left for dead, with one-third of our entire factory workforce laid off. Today, it's alive and kicking adding a half million manufacturing jobs since the beginning of 2010. But there's no guarantee that that success will continue. And we have a long way to go of ensuring that we meet President Obama's goal of creating a million new manufacturing jobs over the next four years. But I will say that I also am hopeful because of people like Keith Ellison, who is the co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Congressman Ellison represents Minnesota's 5th Congressional District, which includes Minneapolis and the surrounding suburbs. In Congress, Congressman Ellison has placed a very high priority on building prosperity for working families and pursuing environmental sustainability. He's a member of the House Finance, Financial Services Committee where he's fought diligently for the rights of consumers. And he's also a member of the influential House Democratic Steering and Policy Committee. In addition, in addition to co-chairing the Progressive Caucus, Representative Ellison is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. And prior to joining the Congress, Mr. Ellison served two terms in the Minnesota State House of Representatives, and he ran a thriving civil rights employment and criminal defense practice. He was and remains a very noted and distinguished community activist. Mr. Ellison was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and he's been living in Minnesota since he earned his law degree from the University of Minnesota Law School in 1990. Uh, and perhaps best of all, he's the proud father of four children. Please join me in giving a great welcome to Keith Ellison, who fights every day for good green jobs. Everybody. Boy, what a pleasure to see you guys. It's late in the day and the spirit is still high. I love that. 
You know, you guys, you know, the stomachs have not started growling yet. You guys are ready to do some good jobs, green jobs. Is that right? I love it. I love it. Well, the operative phrase is jobs, good jobs, green jobs. And I think it's important to talk about innovation and all that stuff. And it's great that we're in a good conversation with management and, and business. That's awesome. But guess what? It's about jobs, folks. It's about economic viability and prosperity for Americans. It means that we have to keep in mind that the overarching idea is to live sustainably and live prosperously for working people. Working people. And, I, and so I'm going to stake a, take a step back in order to take a step forward and talk about the larger economic frame we find ourselves in and then what sustainable economy does to get us to the right place. I mean, the place we're in right now, folks, is we're in a spot right now where for three decades we've seen people having stagnant wages, green or otherwise. We've seen in the, since 2008, our economy has created wealth. 93% of that wealth has gone to the top 1%. What I'm telling you is that we, in, in 1976, we passed a full employment, the Humphrey Hawkins Full Employment Bill. And it was a national disgrace, a disgrace and an offense that our unemployment rate was about 6.3%. It was like, my goodness, how could it be this high so long? Well, we're down to 7.7 .7 and we're happy to have that. Only problem is that most of that is driven by our plummeting labor participation rate. So yes, absolutely green jobs, but don't forget about that part of good jobs. We got to get America back to work so we have any jobs. And that is what I hope drives much of our conversation today. As I said before, you know, the fact is, is that over the last 30 years, the average American has not really made a dime more. And while the richest 1% have seen their incomes triple to over a million dollars, they're making money. And it isn't just income inequality that I'm talking about to you today. And it's not just the fact that working people are doing, are struggling to stay the same, and, it's, and, and the rich are doing so much better. It's that the institutions that have been the ladders of opportunity are actually under assault, like the post office. I hope you plug into what happened to the post office in 2006 and how this element, to, this drive to privatize it is going on right now. But not just that, we just had a big vote last week on the National Labor Relations Board and how they want to hamstrung and stymie that so that workers have no rights on the job and nowhere to go to if their rights are violated. I want you to think about the assault on Social Security and how the Progressive Caucus is leading the way to stand up against the chain CPI and stand for Social Security. And, and so what I'm saying is that that is the larger frame of this conversation. And by the way, it's not just income inequality that we're talking about, and it's not just the assault on institutions that have represented a ladder of opportunity up. It's even bigger than that. Because with this money that is concentrating at the top, it's not just that you know folks can run out of the houses they can buy and the planes they can get and the boats they can ski behind. At some point, you run out of the consumer goods that uh, this world may have to offer, and you start buying other things, like political influence, like political influence. And then you might go and say, well, you know what? I need a tax loophole. No, I need two. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to back people who think I should get one. I'm going to back candidates who believe that if only rich people had more money, then we'd all be better off. They would take care of us, right? They'd hire us. They wouldn't offshore our jobs, right? They'd look out for us. Yeah, right. The bottom line is, I hope 
good jobs, green jobs movement always retains jobs and the rights of workers at the very heart and soul of the movement and always makes sure that sustainability and breathability for working people always stays at the very center of what we're doing. You know, the fact is, is that green jobs are a game changer. They are a way to stop offshoring of American jobs. Investing in American infrastructure is the way to go. It's not only just a good idea for the individual family to have a good, sustainable, high-paying job with good benefits, but it's good for our macro economy when working people have money in their pockets. I mean, even the wealthiest of our country would do even better if we had more shared prosperity. And of course, we know we do better. But the gap, again, is widening. And we can use green, this green jobs movement as a, as a game chamber by encouraging investments in clean energy instead of continuing to hand out over $100 billion in polluter welfare every 10 years, we can shift our economy from a polluter economy to a sustainable economy. That's why me and Bernie Sanders, who was one of the founding members of the Progressive Caucus, came up with the In Polluter Welfare Act, which closes loopholes for industries that uh, are fo fossil fuel-based industries that uh, really are quite profitable right now and don't need our money. We actually subsidize the fossil fuel industry far more than we do wind, solar, and other, uh, other cutting edge technology industries that have a lot of promise for jobs that we can have right here in America. We should reverse those incentives and put the money into the green economy, not just the fossil fuel one. And how about the simple money saving investment in, our, in, our, in, in buildings with more, uh, that are more energy efficient? Residential, commercial, industrial, and public buildings account for more than 70% of the energy we consume. What about the public investment to make these, bills, these buildings more energy efficient? You can't offshore that job, not to fix this building. This is a good thing and we should make, and our legislation and our public policy should direct us toward those, those investments. But you know what? The efficiency investments also pay for themselves. For every dollar we spend making buildings more energy efficient, we get $2 in savings. At least that's what the economists tell us. And so let me just tell you a success story. Sometimes things go right, and we should say so. Company uh, headquartered in my, in my district, Honeywell, recently teamed up with the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority on a, uh, a 33.6 million energy efficient retrofit program. The Honeywell was able to save housing authority more than 3.7 million in utility costs per year. And the project also put 250 tradespeople to work doing everything from replacing old inefficient boilers to weather stripping to sealing doors and windows. Not only did they put uh, American workers back to work, Minnesotans back to work, they made public housing residents a lot warmer in our, we, we still got snow on the ground in Minnesota, you guys. So that's important where I come from. So these projects benefit uh, the people in the private sector, they benefit workers, they benefit the environment, the whole community. And many of you rightly see that climate change is one of our greatest issues confronting it. In fact, I was at a meeting recently when I, when I said, you know what, the defining issue of our time is income inequality. A friend quickly added, said, no, Keith, you're wrong. It's actually climate change that is the most important issue of our time. If this, if this climate changes to the point where we can't live on this planet, it really doesn't matter what the income distribution is. But then, but then being the pugnacious argumentative person that I am, I said, well, what is the biggest barrier to getting real climate legislation? Politics. What's the barrier there? Concentrated money. So then we get back to the need to address income inequality, which leads to wealth concentration, which leads to buying political influence, which leads to a stymieing is that a word? A stopping of our ability to get good climate legislation in place and align our public policy and our legislation with our sustainable economy. So I see the greatest barrier to getting good climate legislation and sustainable legislation passed through Congress. I see the biggest obstacle is money. 
In 2012, 61 large super PAC donors gave as much as 1.4 million uh, uh, grassroots donors. So let me say that again. In 2012, 61, there's probably 61 people on this side of the room. Large super PAC donors gave as much as 1.4 million grassroots donors. You follow that? Okay, do I need to say, I'm gonna say it one more time. So, <laughs> 61 people gave as much money as 1.4 million grassroots donors. Now, you might think, oh my God, we're in trouble. 61 people can weigh as much in terms of money and politics as 1.4 million. But guess what? It's still not the case in America that a dollar gives you a vote. You still got to be a person to vote, and the corporations don't count. Which means our superior numbers outweigh their superior dollars. Our superior numbers, 1.4 million people, small donors, actually is more effective than those 61 big super donors because we don't have to use money to tr and hope that it transmits into uh, votes. We can just go vote ourselves. This is awesome power in our hands. Awesome power. And to deal with that income inequality, which translates into political influence, we have to have a remedy. And that remedy has got to be organizing on the ground. That remedy has got to be organizing on the ground. But it's hard to organize if you don't have the right message. And good jobs, green jobs is the right message. Earn a paycheck and breathe. <laughs> that's a winner. I think that's a winning combination right there. You know, it's time to make sure that, that maybe that single mom living in Minneapolis or Peoria, Illinois, or Stockton, California, can know that you know, her baby, who she has to take to an emergency room at night, struggling with an asthma attack, right? It's time to get her to see herself as an environmentalist and a person who's striving for a good economy that's fair to her and her family. It's time to make sure that that construction worker who may have lost her job you know, after the money from the recovery dried up, understand that climate change is her problem too. And it's time to make sure that that veteran who earned the construction skills necessary to retro buildings, uh, but is still looking for work, know that climate change is also her problem. It's time, in other words, to break out of the bonds of the people who, who, who tend to be aware of problems like this and go door to door, block to block, and organize Americans wholesale around the green jobs, good jobs theme. I know many of you are doing that. I want to let you know I commend you for that. But let me tell you, it's just like my son said. You know, my, my son wanted to be a first-team basketball team, right? And, and he said, you know, Dad, um, after practice, I go shoot an extra five ba uh, uh, baskets every, every, every practice. I said, well, how many do the kids on the starting team shoot? Oh, they shoot like 50 or 60. I said, I, I found, figured out your problem, son. It's not that you're doing the wrong thing. We just got to do a lot more of the right thing. You understand what I'm saying? We got to do a lot more of the right thing. And the right thing is organizing people all over this country. And that's why I want to let you know that the Progressive Caucus, we're going to go on another job tour. Two years ago, we had a job tour. We're going to do another job tour. And we're focusing on cities that have under 100,000 people. We want to go, we want people to know that the Progressive Caucus is not just some big city movement, not just some, you know, uh, big towns. We, we want folks to know in the rural America, in, in white America, in Latino America, black America, we want people straight, gay, people who are in all walks of life to know that a message of sustainability and economic opportunity is for them. So we're taking it on the road. And so we want to thank you guys for all that you're doing. It's an honor to be here with you. 
but organizing is the key and the, you already got the right message. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Congressman Keith Ellison, my congressman, I might add. Before we wrap up today, uh, we have a special guest who's dropped by to lend his voice to our efforts. Uh, O.V. Mahali was a college football player at Wake Forest University, and right now he's a Pro Bowl footback for the Atlanta Falcons in the NFL. He's also the founder of the O.V. Mahali Foundation, which empowers youth to take ownership and pride about their lives and the roles that they play in society. You'll hear more from him tonight at the uh, reception, but the foundation emphasizes assisting quality programs that educate youth on the environment. His foundation slogan is, our future is green. Please join me in welcoming Ovi. How are you guys doing today? All right. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to try that again, because I, I play in the NFL, so I need a little more energy in order to give energy. So we'll try it one more time. How are you guys doing today? Hey. All right. I like that. I like that. And uh, the reason I love it is because I'm excited to be here. You guys should be excited to be here. We're doing something that is so important. We're really changing lives. We're figuring out how best to save our planet, how best to take care of our kids. And there's nothing else more important. There's nowhere else I'd rather be than here with people of the like mind who know how important saving our environment is. Now, I know what you're thinking. What's, what's a 6'2", 250-pound, good-looking fullback doing talking about the environment? <laughs> I know you're thinking it. No, it's okay. I know you're thinking. Let me give you the answer. It's because you can't care about kids without caring about the environment. You can't care about kids without caring about the environment, <laughs> period. End of the line, no A, ands, the, buts. It's just that simple, which is why I don't, I don't understand why so many parents out there, so many people who have a mother, a father, a si you know, sister, a brother, who have family, who have kids, aren't on this bandwagon of taking care of the environment. I'm going to be brief because I'm going to talk to you guys later at the reception, but I have a four-year-old. I have a one-year-old. She turned one yesterday. Thank you. And whenever I watch my, my four-year-old is so protective over my one-year-old. She always, uh, you know, carries her around and wants to push her stroller and, and, and looks at her in such a loving way and says, Daddy, I'm not going to let anything ever, ever happen to my baby sister. Daddy, I'm going to take care of my baby sister. No, no one's ever going to mess with my baby sister. My four-year-old's tough. She, she's like me. She don't. Don't try her, because she'll, she'll fight for, for herself, but for her baby sister, she'll do anything. And there's no way that I'm going to let my younger daughter, my four-year-old, fight harder to take care of my one-year-old than I will. There's just no way. There's so many different ways that you can do your part for the environment. Whatever, whatever job you're in, whatever industry you're in, there's a way for you to do your part. Now, playing in the NFL for almost 10 years with the Baltimore Ravens, the Atlanta Falcons, you know, unfortunately, I've, I've been to playoffs five times. I've never won a playoff game. You know, go, go figure. You know, but, but I had great experiences. I had chances to play with, with Deion Sanders and Ray Lewis. I played with Tony Gonzalez, with Matt Ryan, late Steve McNair. I played, with, I played against Brett Farr. I played with so many great players. Got a chance to come out the huddle, smoke fire, you know, do a rebel yell. And uh, just it's so exciting doing what I've always wanted to do in my life. But at some point, people are going to forget that I played those games. At some point, people are going to forget that I scored those touchdowns. touchdowns. At some point, people will even forget that I did you know, those crazy touchdown dances, dirty birds, all that stuff. They're going to forget. As much fun as I had, that stuff is not going to last. What is going to last is the work that I'm doing every day now that I'm retired to give my daughter the best planet available, the best planet possible. That legacy can never be taken away from me. That legacy will, will stand the test of time. And so it's that legacy that I'm going to fight for every single day. I love talking to you guys more at the reception, but for now, thank you.
Thank you very much, O.V. Now I know I've got the hardcore activists in the room. It's the end of the day. We can start the real meeting. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I do want to say a special thank you to Sam Sewell. Sam, if you're standing backstage, could you come out for a second? busy doing more work. Sam deserves our thanks for all the work she did organizing this conference. Uh, and her team, uh, Aaron Kelly, and the rest of our DC staff, Yvette, Carolyn Bartholomew, Gori Sadwani, uh, Eric Steen and Sandra Boone from back in Minnesota, Corey Ertz, Joanna Willis, Dave Baganigal, Kelly Harris, and Jen Bacham, all of them did a great job pulling together a conference. We still have more to go with a big reception tonight. You'll see uh, our full crowd back uh, this evening. The steelworkers will be joining us, so I hope we have a good chance to uh, network. Uh, I did want to make a couple of closing comments for all of you who have hung in, especially this long, uh, about what's important going forward. And of course, our advocacy tomorrow is important. I think some 300 of us are signed up to go up to Capitol Hill. Uh, and make that progressive voice heard on these issues. Uh, I heard uh, Rich Trumka say, uh, as I've heard him say before, about the refusal of people in the mine workers to uh, understand the word no. Uh, Nelson Mandela once said, uh, it always seems impossible before it is done. And I think those uh, words of uh, simple determination and wisdom embody a lot of what I think we're going through in America today, where uh, the fury that we often feel at being stymied from getting the things that we work so hard for in the electoral arena uh, leads to a level of disillusionment with the process at all. And yet, when I attend a conference like this uh, and help uh, organize it and see the work that goes into trying to bring uh, these varied constituencies together from around the country, both geographically, demographically, and frankly, economically. I see over the years the progress that we're making in creating a different paradigm of solutions. Uh, and the problem isn't so much that uh, we can't get things done, it's that we can't get things done if we go on doing them in the old, old way. Uh, so I'm encouraged when I uh, see, as we saw in the last panel, a different set of voices emerging out of corporate America that isn't afraid to sit down with unions and environmental organizations and believe that the common future we could create is more important than the future they could create by going off with the business roundtable and fighting us every day. But that doesn't mean that our job as advocates and organizers has changed that much. It simply means that the process of how we make change in the 21st century may not be the way we made progress and change in the 20th century. It doesn't mean that we don't organize, but it may mean that we organize with a different voice. It may mean that we don't have the exact same opponents that we had in the 20th century, but the opponents we have are even more powerful. So I hope that we inspire you at this Good Jobs, Green Jobs conference uh, to pick up the tools that we've tried to create with this organization and take them out of Washington into your own community. Our effort over 2013, 2014 uh, is to try to create in the communities of America this powerful dialogue between labor and the environmental movements and make it real in a way that propels us to have a kind of power and a kind of voice that makes people come to the table and negotiate the solutions we all want. We're not going to do that as individual movements. I know that uh, Rich Trumka, from his vantage point, uh, knows that. And as seriously and vigorously as the labor movement fights among itself sometimes, it knows that it can't do this alone. And it's looking for a set of solutions that it can fight for with the environmental movement. And in much the same way, I know that our colleagues in the environmental movement, deep in the battles that they fight and as vigorously as they pursue them, know that we can't get a final solution without crafting one together. So I hope if we inspire ourselves to do one thing at these annual events, 
It's to go back and with some level of determination fight in a common cause the way we can when we fight our individual causes. I spent 30 years in the labor movement fighting struggle after struggle after struggle and feeling that each step I took in battle was a step backwards. And the formation of the Blue-Green Alliance was an effort to try to create a vehicle that allowed that kind of movement building to stop and a new kind of movement building to start in which our common cause meant more than our individual efforts. So I hope that's the inspiration we bring to the diehard activists tonight. Take it out to the reception tonight and let's work together in the future. Thank you very much.